I'm not one to pretend that NPM is perfect. It's far from it. You can check a lot of the videos on my channel to see just how much I don't love NPM. That said, at the time, it was one of the biggest innovations for package management for developers. Before it, we were in the hell of, at best, PIP. And in other ecosystems like Ruby with gems, things could often get even worse. NPM was a massive jump in the quality of experience that we expected managing packages as developers. So what's the problem? Well, honestly, since then, there just hasn't been that much innovation. NPM got bought by GitHub, who got bought by Microsoft, which has allowed it to sustain and maintain itself for as long as it has been. And if that purchase didn't happen, we might not have access to our packages today, which is a terrifying thought. But the amount of effort that they put into maintaining and growing the NPM ecosystem system has been massive, even if the experience and quality of functionality we expect just hasn't improved much since really old versions many years ago. I can't honestly remember the last time the NPM registry shipped a meaningful new feature, and I keep a close eye on that stuff. One of the reasons why is there just isn't competition. And one of the reasons for that is that competing with these things is a bit of a suicide run. With NPM being bundled into Node and the chaos that is hosting and distributing these things across the world, and the lack of any money being spent on these services, like not many people are paying anything to NPM ever. This shit's expensive. No one wants to compete. Well, at least they didn't. Recently, we've actually seen two new competitors come up, not competing with the NPM package manager, but the NPM package registry, the place where we actually get the packages from. If you're currently using Bun or PNPM or Yarn, you're still using the NPM registry to get your packages. Today, this changes a bit though, because NPM isn't the only registrar anymore. There are actually two new ones created by some of the original Node and NPM team. On one side, we have JSR being created by Dino, which if you didn't know this, Dino is created by Ryan Dahl, the who originally made Node. And on the other side, a new competitor just emerged, Volt. And Volt is being made by Isaac, who was the original creator of NPM. So in some ways, this is Node versus NPM, but it's actually a lot of steps further. So let's dive in to the chaos that is these new package registries for JavaScript developers. First, I want to talk about JSR, but what actually is it? And why is it different? First and foremost, it's built for TypeScript and ESM. If you've ever tried to publish a package with type definitions, you probably know how chaotic it can get. It is surprisingly difficult, especially if you're used to just doing traditional like TypeScript app dev. Once you start dealing with weird type aliases within your package JSON to try and make sure things are bound in the right ways in the right places and it all works, it's, it's chaotic enough I had to bring on another engineer to make sure we were doing it all right for upload thing. This stuff is not easy. And I have to give a huge shout out to Julius for making it possible for us to dive in in head first and not just do it, but kind of push the standards a bit. It is amazing how hard it is to do these things. And it's cool to see these new solutions just rethinking from scratch what it would look like to include our type definitions and ESM code in a package. JSR is designed for TypeScript. You publish TypeScript source and JSR handles the generation of the API docs, the DTS files, and transpiling your code for cross runtime compatibility. JSR packages are distributed as web standard ECMAScript modules. The docs generation is another really cool thing. Not only is there kind of a solution for the TS stuff. I actually made a video about this before with tsdoc.dev, which is a really cool site for seeing the type definitions as a nice UI for packages that handle your type defs and things like your JS doc correctly. So this is an example with React Router DOM, which does have some type definitions. And we can go through here and see all of the different functionality that this exports and has type definitions for. And we can read these nice little docs that are generated. The React Router DOM contributors didn't make this page but because they put proper type definitions and proper JS doc comments on their actual work, you can generate a documentation page with TS docs. As you might have seen, depending on how my editor chooses to edit this, it is not the most consistent thing in the world. Understandably so if it's being run as a side project, but it's cool to see them embracing this day one with what they're building with JSR, where they will generate the API docs for you just by blowing a TypeScript source. Generally speaking, it seems like the goal here is you just hand them TypeScript and they figure out the rest, which as a dumb TypeScript dev sounds like a gift. And I'm very excited about that. It also builds on NPM because JSR isn't just a replacement for the registry, it's a superset of it. JSR modules can be used with any JS package manager and in any project with a node modules folder, including Yarn and PNPM. It works with any runtime. JSR modules can be used in Node, Dino, Bun, Cloudflare workers, and more. Module authors can count on great editor support from strongly typed modules without the need to transpile and distribute typings manually. Big win. Apparently, the type generation is uh, not as simple as one would hope. Slow types. In many of its features, JSR analyzes source code, in particular TS types in the source code. This is done to generate documentation, generate type declarations for the NPM compatibility layer, and to speed up type checking of Dino projects using the packages from JSR. For these features to work, the TS source must not export any functions, classes, interface, variables, or type aliases that are themselves or references to slow types. 
Slow types are types that are not explicitly written or are so complex that they require extensive inference to be understood. I don't like the or here. I would just drop the explicitly written because explicitly written types are always going to be fast. You don't need to do work to to get a type when it's explicitly written. But TypeScript's inference is so powerful that it can often take a bit of CPU. And to cite yet another one of my TypeScript videos, the one that kept coming up when I searched Theo TypeScript, guys over at Archetype built a benchmarking tool to see how many cycles effectively are necessary to generate a type correctly in TypeScript, which is really useful if you want to keep the amount of chained nesting for your type definitions down so it takes less power to check your types, which if you've ever experienced your editor being slow to confirm type changes or crashing the TS server, a lot of that is because of bad performance in their type definitions. But sadly, this means that they're pushing you towards return types, which if you've been around for any amount of time, you know I am not fond of. This interface is too costly to be performed by JSR for the following reasons. So these kinds of types are not supported in the public API. JSR discovers slow types in the package. Certain features will either not work or degrade in quality, such as type checking for consumers of the package. It will be slower, at least in the order of 1.5 to 2x for most packages. It might even be higher. The package will not be able to generate type declarations for the NPM compatibility layer, or slow types will be emitted and replaced with any in the generated type declarations. The package will not be able to generate documentation for the package, or slow types will be emitted or missing details in the generated documents. Here is a whole breakdown of what a slow type is. It's actually useful that they wrote this. There isn't a lot of good resources to describe this. But this video isn't about slow types in TypeScript. This video is about package managers for JavaScript. So back to it. Why JSR? The incredible success of Node.js has been driven in large part by the success of NPM. With 2 million going on 3 million packages, NPM is likely the most successful package manager and registry in history. The JS community should look on this accomplishment with pride. So why build JSR when NPM exists? Because the world today is not the same as it was when NPM originally was introduced. This is also why Dino exists, because we've learned a lot since Node was introduced. ECMAScript modules have arrived as a standard. There are more JS runtimes than just Node and browsers, and TypeScript emerged as a de facto standard. These are three really important points. When Node was introduced, and NPM specifically, ESM was nowhere near a standard yet. Now it absolutely is and has moved on well past CommonJS. Dino, Bun, Worker, all these other things now make the contents of your packages matter a lot more. Managing that sucks even more than ever did. And TS has won. We never expected that to happen. It absolutely did. Handling it as part of your package manager is probably worthwhile. In addition to these shifting requirements, there are also opportunities to improve on the developer experience, performance, reliability, and security of NPM. JSR was created to address these new requirements and take on these opportunities. Here are a few reasons why we think you should consider it. Native TS support. We talked about this a little bit before. Dino has really good types of support built in. Bun does as well. You don't have to compile the file before you can run it. You can't just node run TypeScript file. You have to make it JS first. But with Dino and Bun, you just run the TS file and it works. For other environments like Node, the lack of native types of support, JSR, will transpile your source code to JS and distribute your modules with a DTS file to support TypeScript tooling for Node projects. It's cool they just do all of this for you because this stuff sucks to set up, right? ESM modules only. Again, a big deal. They're just saying, fuck you, common JS, we're done. It's a breakup. A modern package registry should rally around the standard and shift the community in that direction. There are, like, ESM is not the easiest thing to adopt and honor the standards for, but it's the right direction. We need to go all in on it. It's cool to see them calling that out. Cross runtime support is a thing they're focused on is cool. They've definitely had issues where getting NPM modules working properly in Dino, although they succeeded, it was never the most pleasant thing. So seeing them make a better solution for both them and others in the ecosystem, this is really cool. JSR is a superset. I'll talk about this a little bit. The important piece here is that it's designed to interoperate with NPM-based projects and packages. So you can use JSR packages in any runtime environment that uses a node modules folder. JSR modules can import dependencies from NPM. Are they not going to have a package JSON for this? Interesting. I'm excited to see where this goes. Outstanding dev experience. The bar is low here, to be clear. Publishing on NPM sucks. So let's see this. JSR has many features aimed at helping module publishers become more productive, including, but not limited to, easy publishing with a single command, CLI walks you through the rest, automatic API docs, zero config publishing from GitHub Actions. That's huge. Publishing from GitHub Actions sucks. Automatic inclusion of DTS files for Node and NPM distribution. Automatic guidance on TS best practices that will keep your code loading as fast as possible and supposedly much more. Fast, secure, and reliable. JSR is intended to be secure, fast, flexible, and also work well in resource-constrained environments. JSR seems pretty hype, but JSR is only one of the two things we're here to talk about. I'm more focused today on Volt because I did not see this one coming. They call it a new home for open source, but the goal is more specific in the less contrasty text here. We're building the future of JS packages. What the hell do they mean by this? 
Let's dig into the blog to find out. Introducing our team, investors, and more from Darcy Clark. Last year, after incorporating Volt Technologies, Inc., I began the search for key venture partners and founding team members. Today, I'm thrilled to unveil the exceptional people comprising our core team and the distinguished investors who share our bold vision, our team. We're putting the band back together. Isaac is the original creator of NPM, former CEO of the NPM Incorporated Corporation, as well as a principal engineer at GitHub post-acquisition. He also led the Node project for an amount of time. Darcy Clark was previously a staff engineering manager for both NPM and the GHCLI teams at GitHub, NPM as well, as well as the co-founder of Themify. So knows how to start a company. It's an important detail. Sorry for the text being small. It's a uh, Everybody sucks at text sizes. I have a whole video about that coming soon. Third person is Roy Adorno, Node.js TSC member, as well as a staff software engineer joining directly from Google. Previously, Roy led key product ships as part of the NPM CLI team at GitHub, NPM, and numerous startups. Quite a crew of people. Seems like they've all worked together and are excited to do it once again. We've done this before, supporting the world's largest package manager and package ecosystem, contributing to the home of open source. We found success together and we're excited to be working together again. Led by the renowned venture firm Excel, our recent capital raise attracted some impressive angels and seasoned operators. Among them, of course, Guillermo snuck his way in, he always does. Evan Yu, creator of Vue in the Vite ecosystem. Pete Hunt, who is an old nemesis turned friend, known for contributing to everything from React to Excaladra all over the place. Fascinating dude, very interesting. And plenty of other really cool names here. David Kramer's, how'd they get Kramer but not me? God damn it, Zeke. Jackson's obviously remix team. All of this makes sense to me. All these people, I'm not too surprised by. So what the hell are they building? Our mission, we care deeply about developer platforms and tooling, which is why we've spent so much time in this space. However, the package ecosystem has stagnated, and so there is a wealth of opportunity to innovate. Our mission has always been to improve the developer experience, and we're thrilled to be working together on it again. Our future. We're excited to share what we're building, and you can expect to learn more in the weeks and months to come. Sign up here to stay in the loop, be the first to know about how the product launches and updates. They have a thank you at the end here, and almost nothing else. They do have an older article from mid last year. What what the fuck have they been building for so long? It's just those two. I'm getting more sus as we go. <laughs> and NPM's package manifest is published independently from the tarball. Manifests are never fully validated against the tarball's contents. The ecosystem has broadly assumed the contents of the manifest and tarball are consistent. Any tools or insights using the public registry are susceptible to exploitation and are likely inaccurate. And bad actors can hide malware and scripts in direct or transitive dependencies that go undetected. Okay, that's fair. If you have a package that is known to be good, and it depends on a package that is at the time known to be good, but it's not a specific enough version, and you bump the version of that dependency and also add malware, now everything downstream depending on it gets fucked. Because the tarball that includes that first package that you installed doesn't include the other dependencies. So if those dependencies change, everything falls apart. And the reason that's possible is that the manifest, which describes the contents of the tarball, is external from it and also allows you to pull in external tarballs. Yeah, there's a real risk here. In terms of novel supply chain attacks go, this is a biggie. And from here on out, I'll be referring to this as the manifest confusion. Interesting. I will say that overall, the NPM team has been quick to jump on these things when it happens, but the amount that they rely on good faith from maintainers is definitely concerning. But if this is the only article we have from the Volt team as to why they're doing this, that's concerning to me. I get the desire to spend a lot of time raising money and incorporating and making sure you have the resources you need to do this. But y'all know me. I always want you guys to ship. Don't talk about the things you want to ship. Just fucking ship. And they're not even talking about things they want to ship. They're talking about the possibility here. There's no why or what or anything here. Just the who. And while I have high faith that these people are incredibly capable of doing this, like you're much more likely to succeed doing this with Isaac than with almost anyone else. And these investors all know what they're doing. That doesn't change the fact that I don't see what they're doing here at all because they don't want me to. This does effectively just feel like a name drop. This is a weird line between stealth and not stealth. And I'm honestly happy that we started with the JSR stuff because it's the opposite. They, they had a little bit of stealth where it was available, but only via whitelist. And they were very specific about what it was and what it was going to do. It's almost like antithesis here. And it's honestly really interesting. Similar to how NPM and Node didn't necessarily agree early on, largely because of Ryan's distaste for things like a package JSON file and the idea of locking dependencies. It's interesting to see a similar rift occurring here between not even how they work, because we don't know how things are going to work over on the other side there. But a rift of how these things are being announced, released, shared with the community, it's tangible here. And I'm very, very curious to see how this all plays out. 
because it honestly feels like change is going to happen. And uh, I've been waiting for change in the NPM world for a bit because publishing packages should not be as hard as it is right now. And I'm excited for a future where anyone can quickly publish some code and use it anywhere in the world. I don't know what else I have to say about this, but I'm excited to see where this stuff goes. So until next time, peace nerds.